Today, we're going to continue on our discussion of enzymes and get into more of the details about how they do their amazing catalysis. So speeding up reactions over and over without getting used up. How do they do it? Let's talk about some catalytic mechanisms, as well as how we can classify enzymes based on the kind of classic catalytic mechanisms they use and or the types of reactions that they catalyze. So remember that enzymes are going to lower the energy of the transition state. So their job is to lower that activation barrier. Remember, if you have your leprechaun and there's a pot of gold at the other side of the rainbow, but it has to get up the top of the rainbow in order to get to the pot of gold. Even if it would be much, much happier with that pot of gold, even if it's more thermodynamically favorable to be at that pot of gold, you have to get over the top of the rainbow. And if that rainbow is really, really tall, it's going to be hard to do that. So what an enzyme is going to do is it's going to lower the height of that rainbow. It's going to lower the energy of the activation barrier and allow the leprechaun to get to the other side. But when you're at the top of the rainbow, you can go either, either way. And so enzymes are going to catalyze the reaction in both directions. Remember that we can also kind of more formally talk about that transition state and the activation energy. We represent the transition state with like this double, double dagger symbol. And the energy taken to get to that transition state, the activation energy, we represent it with this delta G double dagger. So remember that the overall delta G is going to be the difference between your sub the energy of your substrate and the energy of your products. But then what can vary, that's not going to change, but what can vary is the path in between them. And the height of the tallest peak, the highest transition state, that, high, that energy required to get to that, that delta G double dagger for that highest energy transition state, that's going to be our rate determining step. And so if an enzyme wants to speed up the rate at which an enzyme reaction happens, it's going to need to lower that activation air barrier. And we saw how one of the key ways that enzymes could do this was by providing lots of favorable interactions to the transition state. So we remember we wouldn't want it to bind too tightly to the substrate because then we're kind of digging ourselves a deeper hole that that leprechaun has to go climb out of. But if we lower the transition state, if we provide these favorable binding interactions to the transition state, well, now we're able to lower the activation barrier, allow us to get to the other side more easily. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the main catalytic strategies that enzymes use. So the four main ones, we have proximity catalysis, also known as entropy reduction, acid-base catalysis, metal catalysis, and covalent catalysis. So pretty much all enzymes are going to use the strategy of entropy reduction or proximity catalysis. Basically, they're just going to help the molecules find one another and stay in the right orientation to react. So you imagine if you have these two molecules and you want them to join together. If they're all floating around, if one of them is in your bedroom and one of them is in Alaska, Assuming you're not in the bedroom in Alaska, it's going to be really hard for those molecules to find one another. It's going to be hard for those things to find one another. The job, one of the jobs of the enzyme is to actually kind of hold those things close together and hold them in the position so that they can interact. Remember how our free energy, we had that entropy component and we had that enthalpy component. And we said we wanted our entropy to be higher in our, in our products and in our reactants. We want there to be more randomness, more disorder in order for something to be favorable. But if we're bringing two things together, well, we're kind of inherently having a loss of entropy for those two things in particular. But we can offset that loss of entropy by a couple of different things. We can make favorable reactions with that transition state, what we saw before with forming those interactions and lowering the transition state barrier. And we can also kick out water. By kicking out the water, we increase the entropy of the water and therefore we're able to help compensate. But by kind of bringing the things together and holding them in the right orientation, we're kind of prepaying the cost of the loss with entropy with gains in this enthalpic component, with having those favorable interactions with the enzyme that we saw can actually, just like in one interaction with that transition state, can lead to a large decrease in our activation barrier. So we get a large amount of so-called binding energy. So pretty much all enzymes are going to use entropy catalysis, 
And a lot of them are going to use acid-base catalysis, but not all of them. First off, let's clear up the terms general acid-base and specific acid-base. Typically, what we're talking about in enzymatic reactions is going to be general acid-base catalysis. This is where basically one of the amino acids typically is going to be acting as the general acid or, and or base. Sometimes they're going to work through water, so they'll steal a proton or they'll give a proton to water in order to activate it. But the amino acid itself is going to be necessary to kind of kickstart the reaction. In the case of specific acid-base catalysis, that specifically uses water ions as the acid or base and relies only on the pH. So it doesn't need anything to activate the water. The water is just, re the reaction just relying on the natural concentration of those hydronium um, antihydroxide ions in the water that are present at a given pH. As I mentioned, we're typically dealing with general acid-base catalysis with enzymes. So let's dive in and talk about those. A confusing thing for many people is that any amino acid whose R group is protonatable, so it can give or take protons, must by definition be able to give and take protons, meaning that it can act as both a general acid and a general base. When we talk about a general acid or a general base, this is not referring to what we typically classify as the basic or the acidic amino acids. Yes, those ones can participate, and you can have the basic ones be acting as acids and the acidic ones be acting as bases. But when we call something basic or acidic in the context of classifying amino acids, we do that because we're referring to how they act in their neutral form. So in their neutral form, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, they act as acids. They give up a proton, they become negatively charged, so we often see them in their negatively charged states in which case they would actually be able to act as a base. In the case of our basic amino acids, well, that would be histidine, lysine, and arginine. We call them bases because in their neutral form, they act as a base, take a proton, and become positively charged. In this positively charged state, well, this is their conjugate acid form, and therefore they'd be able to act as an acid. But they're not the only ones that can act as acids and bases. And you, instead, you can have any amino acid that can give or take protons. So we're talking not only about our acidic and basic amino acids, but also the ones with hydroxyl groups, the ones with thiol groups, so our cysteine, our serine, our tyrosine. All of these are going to be able to serve as general acids and general bases. Because remember that the enzyme, in order to keep doing things over and over again, um, speeding up reactions over and over again without getting used up, well, that's the definition of what an enzyme does. In order to do that, it needs to be able to kind of reset. So if it gives a proton, it has to be able to take a proton in order to be able to give a proton again. In terms of our general bases, well, what's a base do? A base in one definition is something that steals a proton. And so by stealing a proton, the base is able to strengthen the nucleophile. Remember how we talked about how a nucleophile was going to be stronger if it had concentrated negative charge? That's going to make the nucleophile like less happy and more tacky. Well, if we take a proton, we can then generate that concentrated negative charge. And this is going to then allow us to have a stronger nucleophile that can then go and attack our electrophile. So in this case, we see that a histidine is deprotonating this water, which is then going on the attack. We call this specific, um, we call this a general base, not specific, because basically we need this amino acid here in order to activate the water, but it doesn't have to be a histidine. Any general base would work. Basically, we need something here that can take the proton from the water, but the water itself, there's not enough ions in the water in order to do this reaction without, without help. Once you have this, basically now you have that you're stabilizing the positive charge that would be building up in the transition state, and this is going to lower the activation barrier. Remember that that's how enzymes catalyze reactions, is by lowering the activation barrier it takes to get to the hardest part in the reaction. It can't change whether or not the reaction um, is thermodynamically favorable, it can just kind of make it, make it faster. So if you imagine a rainbow with a pot of gold on one side, it makes the top of the rainbow shorter. But if the pot of gold was still high up on the other side, you'd be able to go back. You'd be catalyzed and it'd be easier to go back as well.
Okay, so with our general basis, this is what we're going to see is something like this. You can see that once an amino acid acts as a general base, well, now it's got a proton, it can act as a general acid. And in order to actually get reset, we need it to act as a general acid. We need to act it to act as an acid, give up that proton, and become reset. So in a minute, we'll look at a ping pong mechanism that's commonly used. We see it a lot with histidines, where we can kind of go back and forth between the acid and the base form. But it's not just histidines that can do this. And the pKa is going to be totally skewed in the active site. So we can see things like an aspartate um, playing a similar role. So we'll discuss that more in a minute. But first, let's return to the idea of our general acids. Our general acids, well, these are going to donate protons. We wouldn't want to donate a proton to our nucleophile, that would weaken it, but we do want to donate a proton to our electrophile, that could strengthen it. So even if we have a weaker nucleophile, something like water, if we've protonated um, the electrophile, um, basically what we're doing in this case, we're protonating this carbonyl group. This is going to make it so that the carbon, the oxygen is going to be hogging even more electrons from this carbon, making this carbonyl carbon even more partly positive, which is going to make it so that the water is going to want to attack, um, or it's going to make it more vulnerable to attack. And this is going to help catalyze the reaction. It can also help make for a better leaving group if you were to protonate what was be your leaving group and it can stabilize the negative charge in the transition state. Similarly to how we saw the general bases were stabilizing a positive charge. Both cases, you're lowering the activation barrier. Okay, so general acids and bases are awesome, and there's actually a lot of different amino acids that we can find them in. So again, we're not talking about just our acidic or just our basic amino acids. We're also talking about our things with the hydroxyl group. So we're talking about our tyrosine, our serine, our threonine. We're talking about our thiol group, our cysteine. And when we talk about the acidic or aspartate and glutamate or basic lysine, arginine, and histidine, remember that the acidic and that basic only refers to how they act in their neutral form but they're able to act as both general acids and general bases. Let me show you a couple examples of what I mean. First off, let's visit one of the biochemist's biggest enemies, RNAs A. RNAs A is an RNAs, it's an RNA endonuclease, and it's basically ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It's secreted by a bunch of different things in order to kind of protect um, from, from invading viruses, which, are often RNA viruses, and so you don't want to have their RNA attack you, so you go on the attack first, and you chew up their RNA. Unfortunately, in the lab, then, you have this RNAs A that's all around, and it can chew up the RNA that you're trying to study. It's also, like, incredibly hard to destroy. Autoclaving only destroys some, but not all of it. I have posts on that and things like that, but I'm not going to get into it. That's the part I don't like about RNAs A, but what I do like is it has this cool mechanism that helps us see what's going on. In the case of RNAs A, we kind of have a ping pong mechanism between two histidines. If we think back to histidine, this is one that we can kind of more easily see can go back and forth. It has a pKa around six. If we refer back to um, acids and bases, the pKa refers to the pH at which half of something is protonated and half of it is deprotonated. If you go to a higher pH, there's fewer protons around, less than half of it is going to be protonated. And if you go to a lower pH, there's more protons around, more than half of it is going to be protonated. As we'll see in a minute, in the context of an active site, all bets are off with this pKa. But for now, let's just say, okay, yeah, we can see histidine can go back and forth, no problem. So let's see how we can do this in the context of an active site. Well, RNAs A, its job is to cleave RNA. So it's going to break up this bond between this phosphodiester bond between these two RNA nucleotides. In order to do this, it's kind of going to activate the RNA to attack itself. Remember that RNA has that two prime OH, that OH that's missing or dehydroxy in our DNA. And so by taking the proton from that, now you're able to make this a stronger nucleophile that can then attack the phosphor phosphorus, breaking off this bond and leaving the cyclic product, which then it can break off. Note that because RNA has this 2 prime OH, it's vulnerable to this, but DNA with it doesn't have the OH here, it's not able to get activated in this way. 
When RNA is A takes the proton, we activate this nucleophile. Now this can attack. In order to make this part a better leaving group on its own, well, now it's going to take a proton from this other side, from the histidine on this side. And so over here, what we have is this histidine is acting as a general base. It's taking a proton. And this histidine is acting as a general acid. It's donating a proton. And now we have the case where basically the situation is flipped. This histidine over here now has a proton and can thus only act as a general acid, not a general base. And this one has um, doesn't have a proton, but it has a lone pair, so it can act as a general base, but not as a general acid. So what's going to happen now is the tables are going to turn, and this histidine is going to act as a general base, take a proton, and activate a water. The water is now going to be a strong nucleophile, which can then go attack, um, attack this phosphate. And then this can then go, this 2 prime OH can then go and it can take a proton back from the cystidine that's acting as a general acid. Now we have the situation reset and we can do this again and again and again and again. So again, we have the cystidine acting as both a general acid and a general base. And we actually have two of them in the active site that are kind of swapping back and forth between their various roles. So as I mentioned, because histidine kind of has that neutralish pKa, we can it's easy for us to see that it can go back and forth. And in fact, in our bodies, we often see it, um, a lot of it in both of the forms, kind of just naturally based on the pH of the water. But it's not just enough to consider the pH of the water, we need to consider the pH of the active site. And this is a impor very important concept because, well, if we look at the what we call the acidic or what we call the basic amino acids, we see that their pKa's are going to be kind of, except for histidine, they're going to be wildly unphysiological. So aspartic acid and glutamic acid, they have these really low pKa's that makes it so that typically the pH of our bodies are going to, or I hope the pH of our body is going to be way higher than that, and so they're going to be negatively charged. And in the case of lysine and arginine, they have such high pKa's that in our bodies, they're going to be typically positively charged. But that pKa is kind of just if it was a free-floating amino acid, and we don't have a free-floating amino acid in, a, in the context of an enzyme, we have these amino acids that are held in place in this active site that's kind of this protected location where there's a local context of the amino acids around it, as well as any substrates and things like this that are then going to alter the chemical properties of those amino acid side chains. So for example, let's take aspartate. If we look back at our chart, we see that aspartic acid has a pKa of around 3.7. So it would be very unlikely to just kind of um, be protonated on its own. But in the case of an aspartic protease, so a protease here we're talking about cutting a peptide. So here we have an example of a peptide that we want to cut into. An aspartic protease is able to do this by using an aspartate as a general acid and general base. It actually has two aspartates in the active site, but unlike before, where we're seeing a kind of ping pong mechanism, instead, the one aspartate is going to be doing all the giving and taking, and the other aspartate is going to be altering the pKa of the first aspartate. What we need to do is basically we want to raise the pKa. We want to make it so that this is going to be um, that this is going to protonate. Having this aspartate nearby, well, now we have this negative charge. We have two negative charges next to each other. It makes this one, they would like repel each other and this one would seek out more positivity. So it would actually be wanting to take a proton. You could take a proton from water, activating the water as a nucleophile that can go on the attack and attack this carbonyl carbon. So we have this aspartate that normally would not want to act as a base that is acting as a general base. It's taking a proton activating the nucleophile, which can go on the attack. Once you have this, you kind of get this tetrahedral intermediate, and now our goal is to split that intermediate in two. We also have the aspartate that's now protonated, and so now it's in the protonated state. It can't act as a general base, but it can act as a general acid. So that's what it's going to do. It's going to donate a proton to this nitrogen. This is going to make it so that this can then leave, um, and we get this whole system reset. So in this case, we have this aspartate that's acting as a general base, and then it's acting as a general acid. Now it's reset so that it can act as a general base again.
And the reason why you can do this is because it's next to this other aspartate. So remember that the pKa of the side chains, or well, anything, is going to be extremely context dependent. In these cases, we're just kind of giving and taking protons. And remember, we give and take a proton. We're not actually making a new like covalent bond to anything other than a proton. We're not linking two molecules together. We're just adding or removing a proton. But sometimes we do see that enzymes will actually form covalent bonds, will actually link directly to the substrate, attach themselves to the substrate as an intermediate. And we call that covalent catalysis. Now let's look at an example of a protease where we actually do use covalent catalysis. So the same overall reaction is happening, but it's going a very different way. So let's look in a little more detail about our serine proteases. Basically, it has this cool like catalytic triad. Um, so triad, there's three catalytic residues. We've got a serine, a histidine, and an aspartate. And what's going to happen is we're going to get this oxygen to act as a nucleophile and attack the carbonyl carbon. Um, but the serine, remember, isn't going to be a very good nucleophile as is. Because remember that the serine is not normally going to be deprotonated because it's got this high pKa of about 13. So we need to actually lower that pKa. Um, so that would be the pKa in isolation, but in the context of the active site, we can actually lower this. Um, and so how do we lower the pKa? Well, we lower the pKa by making stabilize, helping stabilize the negative charge, helping pull away the proton. Um, these things would lower our pKa. And so we're going to find that we're going to have serine get its protons stolen by histidine. And histidine is going to help be helped make more basic, more wanting to take that proton um, by an aspartate being nearby. So what we have is basically you have the pocket on the enzyme in the active site where there's like a substrate binding pot. Um, and this is going, binding there is going to get that, tri that trio into position to get to work. So you wouldn't want things always to be activated always on the all the time. Instead, you only want to activate it when you have a substrate bind. So when a substrate, when the right substrate binds, it's going to fit nicely in the pocket of that enzyme. And the enzyme, it's remember what's it going to stabilize? It wants to stabilize the transition state. Um, and so basically you're going to have like that induced fit. Um, the induced fit is going to help make it so that the trio is right in position to get to work. So the first things first, we got to pull off that proton from serine. And so how are we going to do this? We're going to do this using a histidine, but histidine, well, that's not a very good base, remember? And so how are we going to get histidine to be a good enough base to pull off a proton from something that's not a very good acid? Um, this is where the aspartate comes in, because remember, aspartate is, aspartic acid is a great, great, great acid. It really wants to be in this conjugate base form. It really wants to be in this negative form. In this form, it can hydrogen bond with this, um, with one of the amines in the histidine. By forming this hydrogen bond, what's going to happen is that when the histidine gets protonated, it's better able to stabilize that charge. So it has this kind of like negative charge that can help pro that can help make it stabilize this protonated form. And so the histidine is then going to be able to take that proton. Once you've taken the proton, well, now you've got a strong negative. Um, you've got a strong nucleophile. That serine really doesn't want to be negative. So it's going to attack that carbonyl carbon. Now remember that the enzyme is helping everything be held in the right orientation to do this. It'll attack the carbonyl carbon. We get our tetrahedral intermediates. When we attack a carbonyl carbon, we get a tetrahedral intermediate. It is a real intermediate. It's not one of those transition states, um, but we did have a transition state in order to get here. So we had to form a bond to the carbon, and then we had to break this bond, this double bond, so to get to this tetrahedral intermediate. So in between those, we would have had a transition state where we would have those partial bond formations. Um, but we now what we have is basically we have this tetrahedral intermediate um, and it's attached to the where we're attached our substrate in this case to, is covalently attached to the enzyme because the serine is coming from the enzyme this is our substrate um, but we haven't broken our substrate yet we've only broken one of those double bonds and so now we need to break this off and we want to make sure that we break it off the right way too the enzyme is going to help in a couple different ways um, basically, there's this part on the enzyme that's called this like oxy anion hole. 
um, so oxy anion because it has this negatively charged oxygen. Um, and then there's going to be the uh, amide nitrogens in the backbone of the peptide in this pocket are going to help stabilize this intermediate and kind of make sure that it's going to break the right way. So this intermediate is going to break down. What's going to happen is that the nitrogen in what was the peptide bond um, is going to steal a proton from that histidine. Um, and so this is going to be stealing this proton. This is going to break the first part off, but the N-terminal part is still stuck on the other part. Um, so you still have part that's stuck to the enzyme, and then you have part that has been broken off. So we need to, in order to use this enzyme again, we need to regenerate it. We need to basically kick off this other part so that we can get this, um, can, to do things over again. What are we going to call this? Right, this is going to be one of those general, um, general acid-base reactions. In this case, we're going to be having a general base because this nitrogen is going to be stealing a proton, um, making this hydroxyl ion that can then go and attack the carbonyl carbon. You get the whole situation happening again, but this time, because you're doing it from water and not doing it from the, from the amino acid, you're going to be breaking things off. And so you're releasing the rest of your product. And you can see that we have kind of like two transition states that are pretty similar because we have to do that like reaction state twice. So what types of catalysis was that an example of? Right. So that was an example of acid-base catalysis. That was an example of proximity catalysis or entropy reduction. Not a metal catalysis because we didn't have any metals involved, but it was a covalent catalysis because we were forming that covalent intermediate. So we saw that different enzymes could catalyze the same overall reaction in different ways. We could cut a peptide either with a serine protease, in which case we were using that covalent catalysis strategy. And similarly, we could use a cysteine protease, which basically does the same thing except with a cysteine instead of a serine. Or we could use an aspartic protease, which is actually going to use um, these aspartates to make the water react. And there are even additional other types of proteases we could have where we could have metalloproteases that are going to use metal, glutamic proteases, which are similar to aspartic proteases, but they use um, glutamate instead of aspartate. All of these are just different ways in which we can cut an enzyme or we can cut a peptide using different enzymes. We can also have enzymes within the same like specific types. So we can have serine proteases, and for example, that are going to catalyze different reactions. And when we talk about different reactions, all of them are overall proteolysis reactions, but they have different substrate specificities. Serine proteases get their specificity thanks to this thing called the specificity pocket that we had talked about, or the S1 pocket, that's kind of going to help orient things in place. So if we look at three examples of serine proteases, trypsin, chemotrypsin, and elastase. Trypsin, it cuts next to basic residues. So it cuts next to long basic residues, so lysine or arginine. Chemotrypsin, it cuts next to these bigger hydrophobic residues. And elastase, it cuts next to these small residues. If we go and look at the specificity pocket, which remember is where the substrate needs to bind in order to kind of get, out, get that catalytic trio into, into position, to react, here we can see that these specificity pockets are actually going to be shaped to kind of recognize the things that we're going to cut next to. So in the case of trypsin, you can see this little kind of like red dot right here. This is going to be representing this kind of like acidic pocket that is where the trypsin, um, where the trypsin specificity pocket is, that's going to nicely complement this lysine or, or this arginine. So you have this kind of long, narrow pocket with the negative charge at the bottom that's going to be perfect for holding on to one of those lysines or arginines. In the case of a chemotrypsin, here we want something that's going to be neutral, but we also need it to be big. So here with chemotrypsin, you basically see this big broad channel that's going to be hydrophobic. And in the case of elastase, well here we have this little channel and it's got these valines sticking out of it so that it can really only accept these really little things like a serine and alanine or a glycine. And in this way, as long well as with other reactions around here, we're able to kind of have specificity for a various um, substrate and not be just cutting anything. And finally, we have metal catalysis. Metals are really awesome. They can do things like stabilize negative charge in that transition state, helping lower that activation barrier. 
we'll see that they can give and take electrons to help with redox catalysis. So we'll see this a lot when we go into metabolism. And we'll also see how they can kind of like form coordinate bonds. So basically they form these dative coordinate bonds where a pair of electrons such as on a nitrogen or on an oxygen, similarly to how we saw in our case of hemoglobin. They were basically forming coordinate bonds with the metal. And the metal has this big electron cloud it's, it has the, and this um, diffuse positive charge. It's able to form these coordinate bonds with, those, with a number of different atoms at once. And this is going to allow that metal to serve as a central coordinating hub. And it's also really great if you have a reaction that's going to use like ATP as a cofactor ATP has that negative charge, the positive charge of your metal cation is going to help stabilize that and help make this reaction more favorable and even do things like make the phosphorus in a phosphate group even more electrophilic by pulling the um, negative charge even further away. And so we'll look at it, how we can figure find examples of each of these different things at play. And often we're going to find multiple of these strategies at play within a single enzyme. So let's look at a, some examples of how enzymes mix and match these strategies in order to catalyze reactions. Here's one example, phosphorylation. Our kinases are going to be the thing that's going to add a phosphate group. And they're typically going to add it to a serine, a threonine, or a tyrosine on the hydroxyl group. The phosphate group, or more technically the phosphoryl group, the oxygen is the one that comes from the protein, and then this phosphoryl group, these phosphorus and these three atom, these three oxygens are going to be what's being transferred. And they're going to be transferred from ATP. This is going to leave us with ADP and our phosphorylated protein, or some, phosphoryl some kinases are going to phosphorylate small molecules. And we'll see this a lot when it comes to metabolic pathways, that phosphorylating those small molecules is a great way to do things like make good leaving groups. But for now, we're just going to look at this example where we're phosphorylating a protein. In this case, it's the protein itself that's actually going to have to act as a nucleophile and attack the ATP. The job of the enzyme is to make it easier for that protein, for that hydroxyl group on that serine or on that threonine or on that tyrosine to actually go and attack the ATP. What we're going to see is that in the active site of that enzyme, we're going to have a hydroxylate. We're going to have this negatively charged oxygen that's going to be able to act as a general base, abstract a proton from our serine or threonine or tyrosine, from our protein substrate, in order to make that a stronger nucleophile. And now the stronger nucleophile can go and attack that electrophilic phosphorus in our ATP. But in order to do this, well, we need a couple things. We need that ATP to be there, we need it to be in the right position, and we need that phosphorus, phosphorus to be particularly attacky. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use magnesium in order to help with this. Magnesium, remember, it's going to have this positive two charge. It's going to be able to bind to those ATPs and stabilize it. It's going to stabilize the transition state when we have this attack forming. It's going to stabilize the negative charges. It's going to pull electrons away from those phosphorus. So remember, the phosphorus is going to be electrophilic to begin with because the, the oxygens are pulling electrons away. And now we have the magnesium pulling electrons away from the oxygen, which are already pulling electrons away from the phosphorus. So now this phosphorus is going to be especially electrophilic and vulnerable for attack. We've used this general base to make a stronger nucleophile that then is going to be able to attack. When we have this attack happen, now what we're going to get is we're going to get the ADP pushed off. This is an SN2-like reaction, so it's going to happen in this concerted motion. We have the oxygen attack the phosphorus, and then we get the ADP kicked off. Before this ADP leaves, it can pick up a proton from that hydroxyl group that was serving as our general base in the beginning. So now, remember, it has this proton, so it can't act as a general base again until it gives it back up, until it acts as a general acid. So it can donate that proton back to the, to the ADP, make the ADP more stable as a leaving group by stabilizing the negative charge, and it can also then regenerate itself as a to form, do this reaction again have the ability to act as a general base again. Speaking of that, what catalytic strategies are being used? So we just gave away the one that it's starting by acting as a general base. And then at the end, we saw it acted as a general acid. But what was it doing? What else do we see go on in this reaction? 
Right. We saw metal catalysis. We saw that magnesium sort of serving as that hub and stabilizing the negative charges, helping coordinate things. And we also saw proximity catalysis. We saw that the enzyme was helping hold things in the right orientation to react. So remember proximity catalysis, that's also known as entropy reduction. And we're going to see that with pretty much all the enzymes. One of the things we didn't see though, one of the things that's less common is covalent catalysis, where we're actually forming a covalent intermediate in which the enzyme is attached to the substrate or at least part of the substrate. So although there's a whole variety of different specific mechanisms, we can kind of break things up into a number of classic reaction types. And these are roughly classified by their enzyme commission numbers or their EC numbers. Each of those numbers was telling us something about the enzyme. And the first number in that EC number is going to be the main class of those enzymes. And we have these seven main classes, um, but for the purposes of this class and things, instead of actually focusing on the exact number of these different classes, which by the way, I learned a great acronym, which or acronym um, mnemonic, O2 have lived in London, which I'll tell you in a second. But basically these are the basic types of reactions that we're going to see. We're going to see ligation carried out by ligases, we're joining things together. Hydrolysis, this is going to be carried out by hydrolases, we're breaking things with water. We have group transfer, which are going to be carried out by transferases. Um, we're transferring groups, as it sounds like. Isomerization, so isomerases are kind of going to swap things around. Redox reaction are going to be carried out by our oxidoreductases. And elimination and our bond breaking in other ways are going to be carried out by our lyases. So now let's look at a little more ex explicitly at these. So as I said, O2 have lived in London. And then they had this T, um, this recent, this last class added these translocases. This is actually this really new class. Um, so there had been six classes traditionally. And then they're like, hey, there's actually a seventh class. And so now there's translocases which are enzymes that move things like ions are often across a membrane. And we're not going to worry too much about the translocases and you still won't see them referenced in many sources. But we will see these other types. And the reason why it can be helpful to know the numbers. And so I don't really care too much that you know, oh yeah, four is a lyase, except that when you go and you see an enzyme commission number, if you see a four, four and then you're like, oh, to have lived, and you're like, oh, lyase, then you can kind of tell what's going on. Um, but that being said, what I care most about is that you're able to go and recognize what's actually happening in these reactions and why we classify something as a lyase or why we classify something as a hydrolase or a transferase. So let's go one through one in these different types of enzymes. In the case of an oxidoreductase, this is going to catalyze an oxidation or a reduction reaction. So remember our oil rig, Oxidation is loss of electrons or electron density, and rig reduction is gain of electrons or electron density. Thankfully, with enzymes, the names often give away what they what those type of enzymes they are. And so we'll typically see words like oxidases, dehydrogenases, oxygenases, or peroxidases. You don't need to worry about all these details about how we kind of like differentiate between an oxidase and a dehydrogenase or anything like that at this point. This is just to point out some of the common words that you'll see, some of the names that you'll see associated with the oxidoreductases. For now, what I care about is that you're able to recognize when oxidation and reduction are occurring. Next, we have our transferases. And what they're going to do is they're going to transfer functional groups. So one of the most common things we're going to see is our phosphate or our phosphoryl group. We'll also see things like a methyl group. We'll see things like amino groups. Um, and so all of these are going to be examples of a transferase, where we're transferring a group from one thing to another. So our good old kinase, our favorite enzyme in the world, that's going to be an example of a transferase. We have a group transfer reaction in which we're transferring that phosphoryl group. Next, we have the hydrolase. A hydrolase is going to break bonds using water. Break bonds using water. So it's going to catalyze a hydrolysis reaction. We have some common examples of this are going to be our phosphatases, which are going to kind of undo the work of a kinase. 
We have phosphodiesterases. So this would be things like our endonucleases, our restriction enzymes. So an example would be our restriction enzymes. And we have our proteases that are going to cleave proteins. So remember in our lab, how we cleaved our tag off of our protein. And what was the protease that we used to do that? Right, we use that precision protease, that HRV3C. So the, the protease is an example of a hydrolase. Okay, we have lyases. Basically a lyase is going to make or break bonds without using water or without using redox. And so these are going to be a little harder to identify, but often what they're going to be doing is they're going to involve the formation and or the breaking of double bonds. And so we're going to see things like elimination reactions. So we'll point out some more examples of these, but um, know that this is kind of like one of the trickier things to actually recognize. An isomerase, this is one of the easiest ones to recognize. Here, we basically just have to see where things are being swapped around in a molecule. When we talk about swapping it around, we're not changing the actual atomic composition. We're not changing the number of each atom, but we're just changing their arrangement. This could be just their arrangement in like 3D space, in which case we could have like stereoisomers that are kind of like our left and right hand. And that would be an example of a racemase that's actually doing that sort of conversion. One of the examples we had, we've seen, is going to be with the proline. Remember how proline could be that cis or trans conformation in its backbone? Well, a cis um, proline um, enzyme can actually go and convert between those two. Remember that when you have one of those con configurational changes and not just a conformational change, you actually need help to make and break bonds in order to do that. And so the enzymes can help with this. A mutase is actually going to shift groups around within a molecule and change what links where. And so we'll see some examples of both of these things at play. A ligase, here they're going to join two molecules together, typically with the use of ATP. Join two molecules together. typically with the use of ATP. You might also see other NTPs, so you might see like GTP or something like this. And this would be an example of a ligase. So the ATP is often used to kind of like pay the cost of putting them together by making like preactivating things as a making better leaving groups. But the ATP itself is not really being joined onto the molecule like we saw. It's not being the ATP that's being transferred in this step. It's actually going to be the molecules being joined together, but using the ATP as energy. And so we'll see some examples of this. And then finally, we have those translocases, which we're not really going to worry about too much in terms of their classifications. So now that we have a better idea about the basic catalytic strategies, so we've got our acid-base catalysis. We've got our entropy reduction or our proximity catalysis, which pretty much all enzymes use in order to kind of form bonds with the substrate or more specifically with that transition state that are going to lower that activation barrier, bring things in an orientation in place in order to react. Kind of offset the cost of the loss of entropy it takes to bring those things together. We also had, with some, with some enzymes, we had our metal catalysis where we had a metal ion that was actually helping like stabilize negative charges and kind of serving as that central coordinating hub, maybe making things more electrophilic. And then we had our covalent catalysis where we saw that the enzymes could actually make a covalent intermediate linked onto the substrate or part of the substrate. We saw that enzymes could basically mix and match these strategies, but did so in order to carry out a sort of distinct set of different types of reactions. And we looked at how we can kind of classify enzymes based on their reaction type. In class, we're going to get a little more practice, look a little more in detail about how general acids and general bases can speed up reactions, identify different types of reactions, and really kind of try to interpret the logic of enzymatic reactions. In the coming weeks, we'll go into some more specific examples and see how enzymes are able to be so, so super duper awesome.